Great. So I'm on my phone without my computer in front of me, sadly, because it's died. But um, I can try to do my best to MC anyways. Uh, just remind me if I'm going off track because I can't be looking at the agenda uh, and talking at the same time. Um, but good to see everybody again. Um, please uh, write down in the agenda document uh, if you're in attendance. So we have an attendee list. Um, and uh, for the agenda today, uh, I have two items that I think are really important. One is a proposal to add the trace parent headers, uh, header values to as accessors to the span context object in open tracing. And the other is a proposal for a more formal RFC process um, for uh, versioning the open tracing APIs and specification. Uh, so that's what I've got on the agenda for today. I'm not sure if other people have other things they'd like to talk about. Um, but uh, kicking it off with trace context, uh, we have Sergey here from the trace context uh, W3C working group. Um, and I was wondering, uh, Sergey, if you're on the call, if you wouldn't mind uh, starting this discussion with just a little bit of background around the project and what it, its current state is. Okay, hi everybody. Um, hi, so, Sergey. Yeah. Uh, so, um, we started this, like, the W3C specification was made to uh, allow people in a, like, in a modern world when you have a bunch of services and some of the services uh, owned by you and hosted by you and some of the uh, services hosted by cloud or maybe monitored by some other uh, vendor or maybe it's service mesh that already implemented some tracing in, in, in some form. Um, so we want to enable all these scenarios when you have different uh, uh, components and different uh, ownership of these components to, uh, to correlate telemetry across them. Uh, so in order to do that, you need to have a standard. And uh, we thought what what the place would be for the standard and W3C seems to be the right place to uh, uh, for it to be. Um, with regards to who supported it, like basically all big uh, vendors, including like uh, uh, clouds, like all the all three clouds uh, supported this, uh, this idea. And uh, we, uh, builds this double three C standard. So main idea here is not to make a standard that uh, everybody can use. So like generic, so generic that everybody can squeeze whatever they want into that, but uh, be a little bit more uh, specific what uh, scenarios we want to achieve. And uh, like, uh, it, it feels like every everybody will need to uh, do effort to migrate to this, uh, uh, standard. So some people need to shrink their span IDs. Some people need to uh, like compromise on the size of this uh, uh, header. Um, so there are like all, all, all sorts of compromise that needs to be done. But the idea is like uh, again to you, if you want to uh, satisfy, uh, if you want to comply to this header, you need to um, you need to do something. So it's uh, it's a little bit more prescriptive than. Uh, uh, it's, it's not meant to be a place for like catch all kind of header where you can put whatever you want. Um, so yeah, this is a context. And uh, right now we are uh, in community group in W3C. It means that like the result of this community group is just a basic recommendation. We are working on uh, making it a uh, working group. Um, and the result of working group is typically specifications that, are, that W3C uh, endorses. Um, so it will have more power. Um, yeah, I think this is enough for introduction, is it? If you have any questions. This would kind of be the only place you can get a trace ID out of open tracing. Yes, it would be. So that's kind of revolutionary to call out there uh, because that was sort of assumed to be a vendor specific detail until now. Interestingly enough, if I'm an open tracing vendor, I'm only, and I my let's say my trace IDs are crazy and they're not, they're, you know, eight integers and I don't 
you know, have 128 bid values. That that's so I'm going to be at the mercy of whoever is providing me this parent header. And if I'm trying to provide a feature like, hey, use this ID for logging in and then you can go and search in your elk or Splunk or whatever for this chase ID, I'm now going to be giving um, people this accessor for a trace ID that I didn't prepare or create. You know, if I'm accepting a trace parent from an upstream service that's not using my open tracing implementation. Do you, does that make sense? Um, that not not quite. So you're saying the scenario is uh, when you get a trace parent header handed to you over the wire, right? It could come uh, from someone else's choice about how trace IDs are formed. In this case, 128 bit hex uh, arrays, right? right. That's the, and uh, basic tracer, for example, uses 64 bit uh, arrays, a 64 bit yeah. in an integer. So basic tracers IDs aren't. Um, uh, 120 bit strings. So if I were trying to say, hey, the trace ID for my company's um, tracing system is this value, but actually the, the accessor that they get access to is this value chosen by some other vendor because it came in the trace parent, I'm kind of, um, I'm not actually able to give my trace ID. This, this is sort of like the, uh, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's sort of someone yeah. else's trace ID. So that's why I made a comment in the doc that I think uh, referring to a trace parent is, is misleading. What we're really doing is adding accesses to a span context. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means that you're just talking about your own trace ID. The only relation to the W3C trace parent is just the fact that the industry seems to be agreeing that yes, we want trace ID and span ID concept to be present uh, and therefore that there's a link there. But it's not really that we are oh, we taking that header and basically making it available in a span context. Yeah, um, I I would agree with that. The intention was simply because we appear to have industry alignment on exposing span ID, trace ID, and a sampling bit over the wire. Uh, that and those are things people have been asking for to expose in open tracing. Uh, so it seems, given that there's convergence around this trace parent header, um, there should be general buy-in on being able to expose these uh, accessors for those concepts on the span context. But when I uh, designed the values that they produce, I chose a more generic uh, transport, indicating these should be string values for the IDs um, or something similar possibly multiple different uh, kinds of formats you could access them, but not to overfit to the specific sort of 16-bit text um, ID that uh, the trace parent header defines. So they would be, it would be a looser, looser definition. Okay, so that, like Yuri was saying, the name of this isn't to provide access to exactly what's in the trace parent incoming header. Or that's not, I mean, that it's related to the, the fact that those concepts exist in W3C standard, but it's not, it's not guaranteed that's what you'll get, for example. Yes, that's correct. Uh, these are for, for correlating between um, your tracer and some other system that isn't a tracer. So presumably those other systems don't, don't it's not even necessarily useful, I would argue, to, to expose a very specific um, value type, because the the thing you're trying to correlate with doesn't isn't going to care. Your structured logging system doesn't have a value type for 16-bit trace ID. You know, it has a value type for bytes or string or something like that. Um, so it's it's doubly not particularly useful to concentrate too much on that that format. And okay. also, I would not expect people to be using these accessors to be doing kind of trace header injection or something like that. I would expect them to use the tracer uh, inject calls to be doing anything that was tracing related. So it's just for other systems. So let's say we get an incoming trace from Amazon 
x-ray and it's got, I assume, some kind of x-ray stuff in the trace parent header. But I thought we were also going to be using trace state to kind of store some of that vendor specific stuff. So I would okay. imagine, Sorry, go ahead. I'll oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I would imagine your, your tracer would be the thing that would be extracting that header. Um, and so it has first pass at deciding what it wants to do about all of that. Mm. By the time you have a span context object and can ask it for its trace ID and span ID, uh, your tracing system's already sorted out what it wants uh, to present there. Yeah, and I, I don't want to um, uh, rehash like the entire of the Seattle workshop or whatever, but uh, I mean, the, the long term goal for the W3C project would hopefully involve like genuine interrupt. Cool. So um, I looked at the specification uh, in the GitHub issue. Like, do you plan to expose uh, trace state uh, at all uh, in a spans? As it feels important for uh, some customers to be able to to get uh, uh, vendor specific telemetry from or vendor specific uh, headers from uh, um, vendor specific information from headers. Sorry, which which fields are these? Uh, do you mind explaining them a little bit? Um, so I mean, trace state will be coming as a separate header, and uh, if you didn't parse it uh, in uh, extract and didn't associate it with span, then customer cannot uh, access this, uh, this data from uh, span object itself. Um, so I wonder, is there any plans to, to put this uh, trace state information somewhere? I, I think the, again, the assumption is that both trace parent and trace state really represent a parent span in the, in the caller and then once you're inside the application, your tracing will already read that parent information and create its own span internally. And that's what really open tracing is going to expose, the span ID of the current span. Uh, you don't even have a span object really for the inbound um, span headers. They just like, well, they're in span context, so you kind of theoretically could access them. Uh, but I would say that, like, uh, we, I, I recently opened an issue on, on that regard is that when we do an extract from the wire and we return a span context, sometimes that span context may not even have any trace ID because your system decided, oh, I'm not going to trust the inbound thing. I'm just going to put it aside as a correlation. But for myself, there's nothing really. Until you create a, a real span, then it will get a real trace ID with span ID. And so I think like uh, the, I think the main idea of, of accessors is really you want to use the current spans uh, ID to do anything like login or observations and kind of things. And then it doesn't really matter what came on the wire. Um, it's the only relation to the wire format is just the fact that we all in the industry agree that span ID and trace ID are the thing that makes sense to expose. Okay. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Sorry, pardon my um, ignorance. I am not. I may not be that familiar with all the details. But uh, like, if uh, if we send up application ID as part of trace state, will I be able to get this application ID and like uh, group by it or filter by it in uh, in SDK? Or uh, I wouldn't be able to access this up up ID. I don't think you will because it's a vendor specific thing now. Um, and uh, okay. open tracing is not vendor specific. Yeah. But um, can I put some extension? Like, so if I want to access it, uh, I, I should be able to um, implement my own extract method and then put it in context, and then I will so, be able so, to access it. Sergey, I, I mean, that's what I would say is in general, um, the goal of open tracing is to try and stay away from exposing wire format uh, to the end user. I mean, I think really, if you're talking about some tracer specific internal state, what you would probably Honestly, your best bet would be to do a, an attempted typecast, you know, catch a class cast exception or whatever. And then once you have your tracer specific span context to just access the fields that you want. I mean, that would be the sort of moral equivalent of what you're asking for mm -hmm. in the open tracing world. I don't think that open tracing has a goal um, with this change anyway. I mean, this is my opinion. I'm, I'm curious how other people disagree, but I don't think it would be a goal to try and create um, uh, a generic um, iterator for trace state and things like that that are intended to be tracer specific. I think the idea is that there are a couple of things that, it, you know, 
uh, open tracing has tried to remain incredibly neutral about how um, traces are described, but it seems like there's enough of a consensus around trace ID, scan ID, and sample that we can expose those without having any vendor specific anything. Um, the thing you're asking for is kind of literally vendor specific. So I think some form of typecasting is probably like more in line with the philosophy than than trying to expose all the information to the open tracing API per se. That, that's my opinion. I'm happy to hear others. Um, I, I would say I understand your desire, Sergey, around using those as indices, those values as indices in other systems. Uh, for the reasons kind of mentioned already, I didn't include anything like that in this proposal. Uh, just trying to instead focus on what we know is really, really necessary, which is just the main identifier, um, the span ID for correlating things on the span level and the trace ID for correlating things on the trace level. Uh, there's a lot of value that could be had uh, from those two things. And uh, there's a lot of consensus. It seems that people would be comfortable exposing uh, some kind of value there. Uh, and then likewise, the third piece in the span parent, the, the sampling bit, there's also been a lot of requests for that. And it seems uh, also broadly supportable and would again be useful as a basic on or off bit uh, to determine whether other secondary systems should be running or creating overhead. Um, I, though I actually have, most of my questions are actually around that sampling bit. Mm -hmm. So that's why the focus of this proposal is just on those three fields. I have some ideas for how people could expose some of those other fields through baggage if we didn't want to add another interface. Uh, but I kind of wanted to leave that aside because I was concerned it would be a little more contentious uh, if we started getting into that other stuff. So those are my two cents. Thank you. So is yeah. the Im implication that a tracer implementer should be using an internal um, ID length and format that matches the 16 by stuff that trace parent specifies? I don't think so. For, no, for the purpose of this accessor, it, it's intentionally left as a variable link format um, right. to a, allow you to put whatever you want in there. The assumption is simply that whatever is coming out of there, if it's a span ID, it's, it's unique uh, within the trace. And if it's a trace ID, it's globally unique. Um, and I think that if, if you don't support this, also I should point out returning an empty, an empty value is also acceptable. Um, and that means uh, that it's not necessarily a supported feature. So there's also backwards compatibility. I see, unique across all the um, processes in the trace, all, uh, in the entire distributed trace. When someone's trying to use these for correlation, I yeah. think, yeah, the expectation would be that, yeah. And across vendors. <laughs> That would be good to mention. Yeah, just that different tracer implementers yeah. should strive to make it match, even if their internal tracing IDs don't follow this convention. Yeah. Because I, you know, Dynatrace is five integers, and Trace uh, trace View or App Optics right now is 160 bits, which is annoying. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mentioned this in the proposal uh, that it it's variable link specifically to be backwards compatible with existing ID systems and to also be forward compatible because this is a version of this header. The industry is saying they're probably going to standardize on this, but it could also version again, right? Even the trace parent header has a version field in it, um, which is the other reason why I don't want to overfit to what's currently being proposed as, a, as an ID there. I think our we should have a looser definition simply that we support these fields, um, uh, but we don't indicate too much about the size or shape of the value within them, just the properties that it has around its uniqueness. 
So, so again, you'll attempt to put it into a trace ID, but it doesn't fit, you put it in trace state, right? Is it the idea? Well, again, this spec is not about the header, right? It doesn't okay. make any statements about what the format is on the wire. Oh, got it, okay. It's just uh, how we yeah. can it. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, Sergey, maybe I was trying to think of a better way to say what I was trying to say earlier. Maybe one way of describing it is that, you know, if someone is using the W3C header, that should be, uh, if the, you know, these three aspects of that header should be available in open tracing. Um, and that's sort of the guarantee that's being made. It doesn't mean that if you're doing something other than W3C that you wouldn't also be able to provide your own version of the trace ID. So that is to say, it's not like attempting to conform precisely with the spec. It's just supposed to support these key concepts that people have asked for for years, you know? Yeah, makes sense. And I'll, I'll redraft this this proposal to, to make this a lot clearer. I can see where the confusion is coming from now. I, I just uh, one other question, um, sort of uh, the is sampled. I, I was raising this question, like, do we want to clarify what is sampled means uh, the bit? Yes, I, I because I don't work, uh, I have not done a whole lot of instrumentation with sampling based systems. Uh, I personally am not very familiar with what the use cases are for uh, having that bit exposed. I know it's been asked for repeatedly, um, but it's not clear to me what, as a Boolean, what kind of logical switching would secondary systems be expected to be doing based on that value. So I really think that's the semantic meaning for it. Like, why, why what am I going to do or not do, uh, whether when that thing is on or off? It's not clear to me. Yeah, I, I guess one use case I remember people were asking and saying, oh, I want to add a lot more profiling, but I don't want to bother if this like trace is not being sampled, right? So that could be an example. But again, that doesn't match with the, for example, with the W3C definition, because there it says, if it's zero, it doesn't mean that it's not sampled. It's just like, we're not telling you whether it's sampled or not, right? It's like, it's really, if it's one, then yes, it is sample for sure. Uh, but zero means like we haven't made the decision yet. Yeah, yeah that, that's the main idea. Um, and uh, we, we, we do a lot of sampling in uh, our systems and uh, uh, we will uh, treat this flag as like somebody, if somebody said it to once and uh, yeah, we will t try our best to sample it, uh, to, to cal collect it. But uh, if it's zero, we still will like, we'll be on edge of making this decision. Yeah, so mostly it's, uh, like, and even if it's one, we will try our best, but we are not guaranteeing that uh, it will be corrected. It's mostly flag, like just a way to communicate between uh, um, layers. Like first layer may say something about, yeah, I really want it because for some, uh, because I think it's important. Yeah. And one, one uh, nuance that I think is a bit different between the wire protocol and an in-process accessor for this bit is part of why I think it's vague about whether you should respect this in the protocol spec is it can be spoofed, right? Like you don't, you can't necessarily trust what's come over the wire. And so uh, you have to use this sampling value as an indication, right? It might be coming from another system. It might be faked. Uh, so it's, it's kept partially vague. I know for that reason. Um, and in the in-process accessor, by the time you've gotten to a span context object, the tracing systems already created that object for you and is running. So it knows whether it's sampling or not. So you don't have, you don't have the trust issue in this case around uh, whether or not you should trust that value, right? Like it's a little more definitive, but uh, there's still some just semantic implications about what, what does it mean that it is sampling or is recording? Just because there's, there's it seems like that's a vague concept in some systems. Um, for example, we may be recording it now, but not storing it permanently would be a way LightStep would 
would do this. And so we would, our question is, would we say sampling is always on? Is that what, how we would use this header? Yeah, I, well, yeah, there's. There's also another option is that when, uh, so yeah, you may be recording, um, but you're really waiting for the for the downstream to send you back a signal saying, oh yeah, that was interesting, so please keep, keep what you recorded. Um, so normally you yeah, yeah. zero actually, even though you're recording, you like opportunity to record, but not really. Yeah, Yuri, what you were saying earlier about people using, in terms of the open tracing access around span context, I'm not talking about sampling in general, but in terms of the access around span context, perhaps the most important use case is uh, indeed for just an optimization that you can not do anything thing if something is being sampled. This doesn't line up particularly well with the W3C thing, but I almost wonder if it shouldn't be a sampled bit, if it should instead be a, this is not sampled bit, it's more of a like a no-op bit. I mean, that's um, that's actually actionable from uh, a code standpoint in a way that I think could be pretty meaningful in a performance context. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's totally at odds with the way that people tend to think about this field in the W3C world, but um, but it just occurs to me that that's really what you want to know. Is it not sampled? And then, you know, whether it's sampled for now or sampled for later in the way that Ted, you know, was asking about becomes irrelevant. Uh, my proposal was to separate these two, actually, the span ID accessors from the sampling, because it seems like sampling isn't like very clear understood what, what really people want to use it for. Um, so I would rather go back to, to the people yeah. ask for it and say, like, let's define the use cases first. Whereas for fake ID and they're very clear in it. Well, at least for login, they're very clear. Yeah, well, that, I, I understand what you're saying. That, that makes sense. I, I'm also fine with, with pulling that out of the proposal. Uh, if we can't, if, it, if the value for them is not, is not clear and, and immediate, I just know it's, it's a thing that does come up repeatedly uh, and get requested. I mean, it doesn't mean that we just like shelve it completely, right? We can still work on it. I would just yeah. rather uh, prefer to move on the uh, the span ID accessors because that seems like a very easy thing to just roll out and then give immediate benefits to people. Whereas with sampling, like not everyone asks for it, and and we can we can work a bit longer maybe on that. That makes sense to me. Um, on that note, is there anyone on the call who is? Uh, concerned about exposing span ID and trace ID as far as their system uh, goes and thinks this would be onerous for them. I won't take the bait on onerous, but uh, I, I will say that you know, we've given plenty of talks over the last few years about open tracing being an instrumentation API that can be used for things like Prometheus and so on. And those use cases really don't need the stuff which is fine with me i think we, I, it just means that you know we have to make sure the documentation is is clear about whether or not this um these trace and span IDs are sort of like quote unquote required or if it's okay to return empty string or something like that if you just don't need one i mean if you're just doing uh, tracing to metrics exporter and you're doing that via some kind of tracer implementation i wouldn't want people to have to stress stress out about these requirements yeah, and and for me as someone who doesn't use 128 bit trace IDs, it's a little bit onerous um, because in the long term for cross vendor correlation, it would be better if I were right because that's what's in the trace context spec. But I don't think that's a different challenge than New Relic or Dynatrace is also going to have to face. Where not not none of those three companies do 120 bit trace IDs today, so. Um, and for anyone to support trace context and have um, this correlation, you'll need to be able to get a unique identifier that's cross vendor compatible. Amazon, for example, also isn't um, isn't doing it this way. So uh, 120 bit IDs. Um, so you know, I, I think we could start giving you these un incompatible trace IDs and then have support for the the trace context stuff later. For example, like you're saying with the strings not having a fixed length. Uh, 
But is it incompatible? I mean, if you're using one tracer in the systems, then yeah, uh, then it's fine. It's right? Issue at all, right? And it's only yeah. about this cross cross system thing. Exactly. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. Yeah. It, it's only important if you want to mix two different vendor. And even if you mix vendors, it's really I think the question. I would expect people to be able to configure their uh, tracing libraries, saying I don't trust the incoming ID, or I'm fine with just reusing it. Um, like. Uh, because, exactly. Uh, like, yeah. if you look at the notes in the in, in the workshop, uh, like uh, the so-called generic tracers, which technically don't even need the custom vendor section, right? They can just use the the parent the parent header. Um, but even then, like, if it's very easy to do a denial of service on them by sending the same thing, if they can. Yeah. Like, so some Absolutely. people say at the edge, I'll never gonna trust this thing. And that's the, yeah, and that's the part, I mean, certainly if you're trusting authenticated APIs across vendors where you can trust the sampling decision and the trace ID and you just happen to be using X-Ray in one thing and some other company in another and there was this magic way that you could be sure to trust their IDs, that would be cool and then you'd have this magic cross-vendor um, reference value. But uh, yeah, in, in practice, people are going to have to be very careful about uh, writing rules to filter or have, use links, you know, to do the the reference of, of it's not going to be a globally uh, unique value across all the uh, the components in the distributed trace until you can have that functionality at the edge of your service, like in some nginx configuration or, or or service stuff, right? Like that that part seems tricky to me to promise that it's that unless. Um, uh, unless you're using the same a single vendor, that's pretty much the only way it's going to be that for a long time. I guess that could be made more clear with documentation. Yeah, I can see making it clear that this is these expectations are only expectations within the tracing system you're talking to, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever tracing system is running in your process, and you're asking it for its fan ID and its trace ID, your expectation for you it's really only a relation to that system. You're not asking it to know about other systems you might be using yeah. or putting into you know, whatever you're correlating with. Not yeah. how can yeah. that system know? Yeah, <laughs> and I think that would be just helpful in tempering expectations that this is gonna be a magic value yeah. you can go looking everywhere for. Um, that makes sense. Cool. I noticed census also has accessors like this on the span context. Is that part of the motivation? For trace uh, ID and trace options and span ID? It's not, uh, it's census in particular is not the motivation. The motivation is for um, the ability to add span and trace observers in a sort of generic fashion. When we tried to, to, to do this, uh, the lack of any kind of identifier really makes it awkward. You end up with a lot of machinery trying to track these things around, around potentially creating objects and using uh, basically pointer addresses as your IDs in a weird way, and mm -hmm. it, it's just awkward. But there's a huge amount of value that would come from being able to correlate this information to other systems. So what people are doing right now is simply vendor specific way where they're passing the features to get at whatever identifiers are down there. So if we can stop people from doing that by giving up the accessors, then uh, there's a bunch of code that could become shared in open tracing code. So that, that's the real hope. Uh, I shouldn't say hope. Uh, there's a lot of clear values that's been identified on that front. Um, we, we've had users asking for trace ID to use in the logs from like day one. Of open yeah, source. definitely trace ID. Yeah, I, I get a lot of requests for that too. Uh, I don't have a span ID. I'm gonna have to make one. It'll be the start event <laughs> ID. Start event yeah. ID, end event ID. I'll give you the start. That's the safest one to give you. But 
also, I think one thing to look at though in the spec is it does say like you can produce a trace ID and when something asks you for span ID, you can just give back an empty value. Um, and I don't think we can, I don't think we can realistically add anything to the open tracing spec that wouldn't let you do something like that. It needs to be some kind of backwards compatibility. We can't automatically force everyone to now magically produce a span ID. It's just that some of these secondary systems may not have as much utility um, and they might have to do value checks before they do something, which is like a mild inefficiency, I suppose. Um, but I think that's that's all worth a worthy price to pay for, for backwards compatibility and not adding some new required feature to support open tracing. Um, and again, in practice, I think it's the kind of thing that's not too concerning. Like if you're using a tracing system that doesn't support this stuff, and then you would like to use stuff that wants it, you're just like, oh, oh well, my tracing system and this cool other library don't work with each other. But it's not, it's not like a disaster um, or something that would be unexpected for the developer. Presumably the person gluing these things together at least somewhat aware of the kind of tracing system they're using. Um, so I don't see the compatibility issues as being uh, too dangerous for people who don't already support this kind of stuff. And by stuff, I mean span ID and trace ID. Okay. So I feel like my big takeaways are to really clarify that this is not um, header specific. Uh, it's not specific to the trace parent uh, supporting explicitly that uh, what's in the W3 spec is just supporting fields that are similar to the fields in that spec. And to really emphasize this is not for automatically allowing a cross tracer uh, compatibility or interop that 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 would not be the intention of accessing these things and then thirdly to drop the the sampling bit from this proposal and to move it to a separate proposal um, because the debate around that I think is a little more vague great thanks everyone I feel like I know enough to move this proposal forward another step. Um, and it's uh, 9.15. Uh, so unless other people have more questions on this, uh, I would suggest maybe we move on. Thank you for inviting me. I, I, I'm gonna drop off. Great, thank you so much, Sergey. See you. Great. So the other thing I would like people to have a look at, and I don't really know if if 10 minutes is enough time to have conversation about it. And also I wanna leave room for anything else anyone else wants to talk about. But uh, I did create a pull request uh, around a more specific RFE, RFC process for moving the open tracing spec uh, forward, where each proposal to change the API um, is first drafted in a document called an RFC that is committed to the specification repo. Uh, it has several states it moves through from draft to testing, where we then implement uh, a version of the proposal as an API change uh, in a quorum of major languages. And if that looks good, then we mark the proposal as accepted and add the language in it uh, directly to the specification. Um, so I'm curious, just sort of hot takes from people who have had a chance to look at that proposal. Is this something that looks generally like the right direction to them? Do you think it's uh, generally something we need? Do they wish it was uh, following a different format, et cetera?
Chris, you're on mute. Is it that, yeah. Is it that no one has any opinions or no one read it? <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay if you haven't read it yet. Um, I would just ask, uh, please, please take a look at that because I think it's, one, I do think we, we definitely need a formal process for change. Right now, it's just too cowboy. I mean, it, it has been working because people are nice and care and are trying hard, but it would be, uh, I think, more open to, to people outside of the sort of smaller inner OTSC group when it comes to making proposals. Uh, if there was a, a more obvious, clear format for how that worked. Um, and it would also help coordinate uh, getting these changes out across several languages at the same time, rather than what we've been doing so far, which is try to sort of uh, test drive it in Java. And then if that looks good, then roll it out to the other languages. That kind of takes a long time. And we now have a cross-language working group of people who are interested in making these changes in their various languages and domains. So we've got sort of the, the open source staffing available to, to make, decide we want to add something like span ID and trace ID, and then go test and roll it out in, you know, three to five languages at the same time, and then add it to the spec. So I think we have the ability to make these changes faster and more coordinated, but we do need some structure to explain to everyone how we're going to do it. I have had a look and I do like this uh, format. Um, I'm not so passionate about the actual structure of it, but having an RFC is a good thing. And uh, your example is also a good first example for that. Thanks. Oh, yes. And I should mention uh, this trace parent proposal. If you are looking at that, it's written as one of these RFCs for the RFC proposal. So it's sort of a prototype. Great. Well, I don't think we can have too much of a debate on this until people have have uh, read it and thought about it a bit. Um, so I would ask uh, people, especially um, specification council members um, and members of the cross-language working group who are on the call, if you can look at this next week and uh, weigh in on it. Uh, in particular, if you, you think it's, it's just uh, radically missing something, uh, it would be good to, to flush this out because um, now that we've got more people involved, it would be great to sort of tighten up uh, this structure sooner rather than later. Um, should we set some time um, to, to kind of have it approved? Sorry, I couldn't quite hear that. Should we set some timeline to have it approved? Um, to vote on it, maybe? Hmm. I'm not sure how to do that. We could have, say, like by the next OTSD meeting, we need to, to have this approved or something approved, or at least a clear idea of why we're not going to move forward with anything. Um, yeah, so I think this, um, I'm kind of trying to draw parallels with the CNCF uh, TOC meetings. Um, they usually they hold votes just online uh, and i think the um the meetings i use just to present things and maybe ask questions uh, people can also ask questions on the pull requests but uh, my my concern is that if we say oh let's just wait till the next uh like wait a month and then try to approve it but by the in, in a month we can be in a similar situation like oh no one actually read it um yeah so I would I would prefer to just like set another timeline saying like let's let's give people a week or two and then call a vote within two weeks let's say uh, and and then just close this. That makes sense to me. Anyone has objections to that?
Sounds good. Okay, I'm writing to the notes then. Okay. There's nothing terribly original in the proposal. I think uh, um, the thing for people to think about that's just a little maybe unique about open tracing and why we can't just adopt some pre-existing thing entirely off the shelf is the the shape of what we're trying to create is slightly different from most projects. Most projects are either like a single implementation of something, like Prometheus is an implementation of a metric system, or it's a standard like a wire protocol where it all it all can fit into a single RFC or a single document that you're iterating on. And we have this um, a slightly funny shaped project, which is a, a cross language API uh, standardization effort. Um, and there just aren't a whole lot of those. Um, but it does mean the the process has to tie together. Uh, multiple code bases with multiple versioning schemes and things of that nature. Um, so that's that was why I felt the need to sort of invent a, a proposal process that was based on some of these other things, but wasn't just literally the W3C RFC process. Yeah, um, I mean, even even libraries like gRPC. Uh, they have this cross language nature, but they don't have multi vendor nature that we have. Right. <laughs> it's not an in interface of cross language implementation. Right. And then, uh, like a bunch of CNCF projects, which are also standards, they have cross vendor, but they don't have cross language nature. So we were kind of in a unique position here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, like the other I think it's better just to have something written. It doesn't have to be like set in stone and uh, pedantic about this thing, but like a general outline is is a good to have. Yeah, we can also always iterate on this process, right? Like if this this seems like a decent proposal process now, we can start with this. If it seems lacking in some way, we can always just modify it. Not. <laughs> we don't require backwards compatibility on our proposal process, so it's okay. Um, do we have any other agenda? Uh, I mean, I actually had one question. I don't know if uh, I think Carlos. Oh, Carlos, he's, he's still on, right? Uh, can we talk about yes, yes, about Python? Yeah, so basically, uh, yeah, I was checking your comments uh, from uh, from the latest days. So, um, so I guess your questions are regarding the, uh, about examples, I guess, right? Uh, it's examples and uh, I mean, unfortunately, when I was doing instrumentation with Tornado, you, you kind of, you want to write your instrumentation in a completely framework agnostic way, but uh, at least with Tornado, you do have to use this special context manager called spec, stack context. Uh, without it, nothing works really as far as uh, propagation. Uh, and I don't know what, what other frameworks are doing. That's why I was kind of curious um, because simply just having thread local span, uh, sorry, scope manager doesn't work for at least for Tornado. Yeah, so uh, so in the examples, I am not using this uh, spec manager like uh, in all the examples because I was kind of porting them from Java. So uh, I, I will probably add a comment later today, but uh, some of the examples do use it. Um, so regarding the other frameworks, both uh, Manu from Datadog and me, we have been looking into a similar approach for other like, like GFN, async IO pretty much. And basically, what they provide is some kind of thread local alike um, um, storage where you can have different storage for each coroutine. But there's no, there's no uh, automatic uh, propagation. So, in that case, you basically what you end up doing eventually is that you provide a specific scope manager for each one. And then you also have to um, include some helping function or, or even patching the library. So we, so these code managers end up collaborating with this patching code. So you can have uh, this propagation that 
turtle has out mm -hmm. of the box. So yeah, so it's um, well, and as I said, uh, yeah, of course, if actually part of doing this uh, for those of you who don't know of doing the uh, release candidate one for the new API and scope manager integration to the Python API was to to bring more eyes project. So yeah, if somebody has more experience with specifically with async IO and and G event, that would be great. So I don't know. If, I don't know if somebody has, but just let us know. I don't know if that answered your question. I, I think we will ha still have to go through the examples and discuss a little bit more right there. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I agree that we, we will have to use different scope managers depending on the framework. Uh, the I, I guess the question is is really whether the API itself is uh, is reusable. Uh, for, for example, like you may be using I think framework, uh, for like the event loop framework, but you may also use some standard like some people do that. Uh, let's say URL lib uh, instrumentation, and uh, we typically monkey patch that. And when you monkey patch it, you you want to get your um, context or like the the scope from somewhere, and you don't really know what kind of scope manager you're using at this point. So the instrumentation has to have some sort of a unified way of saying, okay, I'm still should be able to get the current current span, current active span, uh, regardless of uh, whether how it's propagated to me. So I, I'm not saying that this is a problem. I think we just like we just need to. Uh, uh, try different frameworks and examples. Yeah, I think that's it. Actually, I remember talking about that to Ted, I think, previously, like a few weeks ago, because exactly, I found that um, there are a few enough differences uh, here and there that maybe we need to clarify eventually or something, because uh, so in general, for example, I think that we, we can create a scope manager for each one of these frameworks but they have a slightly different semantics details and uh, we need to, to be aware of them for a start. So um, I actually, I, now based on what you told me, I think in the Python examples, I'm gonna start writing a summary of what are the exact implementation differences or you know, like, or the, the expectation of, of each scope manager. So we can get a, a better idea instead of just showing the examples around for each, for each framework. Okay, sounds good. I have a question that will only take one minute. It's on the agenda. Um, I was trying to make trace context implementation for basic tracer for Go, and I was talking to Sergey about it and understanding the 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 draft he updated and and uh, Alois updated, but I I. Ran into just um, the parsing was fine, parsing was easy, but then I got to the place where I realized I needed to use decide whether to change the tracer to use 64 bit. It currently uses 64 bit trace IDs, and do you think it should be changed to use 128 bit trace IDs, or should it be done in this um, in this pattern where we discussed in Seattle? You could put custom vendor stuff in trace state, and then you know allow the 128 bit trace ID to be stored in some kind of span context place and and then spit out when you propagate out again later. But internally, you're still using a 64-bit trace ID inside of the tracer itself. And whether that the complexity of that was worth keeping like the protobuf wire protocol the same versus, um, versus just changing basic tracer altogether to use a different internal trace ID size. I, I don't think mm -hmm. um, I haven't done an audit of the basic tracers, but it sounds like when it comes to picking a, a wire protocol that they use uh, and header types and stuff, it would be great if we picked something across languages that we intended all the basic tracers to converge on. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if they're even all compatible with each other at the moment because they're sort of just started as example code, right? Um, I, I never looked at the other ones. <laughs> <It's not> so, <laughs> I have no idea how what the size is in Python, for example. Yeah. 
that that would be my only request is whatever we pick okay. as the default behavior is that they can all interrupt with right. each other. So Python's in 64, just like current Go is. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, that just opens a question for then to demonstrate compatibility with receiving a trace parent that's 128 bit, you need to put that 128 bit identifier somewhere and then spit it out on your algorithm calls, right? And is it worth doing all that and doing like that custom vendor thing? Or is it worth just changing all the basic traces to do 128 bit IDs? Either one, you know, one's an interesting demonstration of the custom vendor thing, you know, where, hey, this, this tracer doesn't support 128 bit trace IDs, but look how we still made it work with the W3C standard. And the other option is, hey, this is a conventional, you know, W3C supporting tracer, and it's and then there's no implementation. Or I could do both. I was actually going to do both, thinking doing both. <laughs> My, my suggestion, and it's just a suggestion, is that, well, in general, I think we need to, to revisit the basic tracers and decide what their purpose in life is for. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, independent of that, I, I do like the emphasis on basic. And I like the idea that, that there's simple code that you can read that does the canonical, whatever the current test standard is, right? So having them by default in a very basic manner support 128-bit, you know, IDs and sort of doing everything canonically correct right. would be my my suggestion. But then Ben will be and then mad. We can <laughs> Who would be mad? Ben, he likes 64 bits. Oh. Oh, yeah, I think you're right about the ben, canonical awesome. thing. Okay. Yeah. So that would be my suggestion is just that they 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 are canonical they they, they match whatever the w3c spec is on headers and it would be then it, i agree an interesting experiment if there's a way to add some optional you know or plugins or something that allows you to do some switcheroo with this header mm -hmm. um or with these ids that turns out to be a useful thing to explain to people, but it seems a little secondary. Yeah, I would suggest starting with the, like a, what they call level one component, mm -hmm. where you you accept in kind and trace ID, but you not use it as your own. You just store it as a as a tag somewhere, uh, because then you don't have to change all the basic traces all at once. Uh, you can you can and you already have like some compatibility with the spec, uh, and then the next space could be okay well maybe we can support 128 bit but then as we said if people are using basic tracer at the edge they may still want to have to be go back to a level one where saying okay yeah we, i'm just going to record wow. it down and not this huh. yeah that's interesting yeah okay i like that We should have a broader conversation about the basic traces at some point, though, because right now, like, some people, including myself, see them as example code that's supposed to be very simple, just so you have, can kind of get a handle of like what the true basics are, and maybe you can clone it and do something with it. But then there's also people who would like some basic thing that, that handled the wire protocol propagation for them and then they you know can then just write some little plugin to uh spit out the span information somewhere um and then there's backwards compatibility or no backwards compatibility uh there's just a bunch of questions around them um and like what their point is and i think we should clarify that at some point especially if we're going to be changing them uh, uh questions of backwards compatibility come up people actually run them yeah. I just thought it was like a reference. Okay, huh. What I mean, for example, at Lightstep, <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. At, at Lightstep our, our tracers, at least in some languages, still even reference a basic tracer. Um, like, that's how lazy we are in Python. Um, but that's, again, like, I would say if the basic tracer changed, though, then we would just clone the code we wanted 
and like life would move on, like we would be fine. Uh, I just don't know what people's expectations are around them. I think we should clarify them one way or the other. But we can do that later. So other conversation. Okay, we're out of time. Alrighty. Cool. Okay, thanks everyone. Happy Friday. Yeah, and get her. Thank you, ciao. Mm -hmm.